All right, hello everybody. We were waiting a couple of minutes to get, let everybody have a chance to grab their pizza and drinks. Looks like you all got it. Um, I'm just going to do an initial welcome and then turn things over to Adrian, who's representing the International Law Society today. But I do want to share some great news. Uh, first of all, for anybody who doesn't know me, and I know we're also beaming this to alums all around the world, I'm Dean Scharf. I've been uh, Dean of the Law School for 10 years, but I also have run the International Law Program. So we're really excited to have this particular speaker today as our first speaker for the second semester. But my exciting news today is that the Jessup International Law Moot Court team, and I see um, Brianna back there, I see Ellie over there. Is there anybody else from the team there? There you are, Sydney. Um, they went out to Chicago and they got the trifecta. So first of all, they didn't drop a single round and they won the competition. Then they got the best brief in the competition, and then Sydney was the best speaker in the competition, and Elise Manchester was the fourth best speaker, and the rest of the team had very high speaking points, so we were the top seed. I don't think we've ever had a Jessup team that cleaned up quite so, so well. And if you go into the back of the um, room there on the other side of that wall, you'll see all the trophies from the Jessup team over the years. And I think this is the team that has brought back the most trophies ever from a single competition. So congratulations to all of you. And that's a big win for the law school as well. Well, so glad that all of you are here. We've got a great speaker today and I'm going to have Adrian introduce John Sopko. Hi, my name is Adrian Pohl. I'm the Vice President of the International Law Society, and today it is my pleasure to introduce Inspector General John Sopko. Um, John Sopko was sworn in as Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction on July 2nd, 2012, after being appointed by President Obama. Congress created the Office of the Special Investigator, or the Special in Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction to provide independent and objective oversight of the Afghanistan Reconstruction Funds. SIGR con conducts audit, inspections, investigations to promote efficiency and effectiveness of reconstruction programs and detect and prevent waste, fraud, and abuse of taxpayer funds. SIGR's work has recovered or otherwise saved the U.S. government almost $2.6 billion, secured 137 convictions, and produced over 500 reports under the leadership of Inspector General Sopko. He continues to advocate for stringent oversight of the billions in U.S. and other international assistance to Afghanistan that has been provided to the Afghan people since the sanctioned Taliban regime's return to power, despite the regime's dire human and gender rights record. In his presentation, he will discuss what worked and what didn't during the United States' 20-year engagement in Afghanistan and identify lessons from America's longest war that are applicable to similar effect, or efforts in other contingency environments, including the international effort in Ukraine. Mr. Sopko brought more than 30 years of experience in oversight and investigations as a prosecutor, congressional counsel, and senior federal government advisor to the Office of the Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. Previously, he had been a partner at the international law firm Atkin, Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld LLP since 2009. Mr. Sopko's government experience includes over 20 years on Capitol Hill, where he held key positions in both the Senate and the House of Representatives. He served on the staffs of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, the Select Committee on Homeland Security, and the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. Earlier in his career, Mr. Sopko served as state and federal prosecutor. As trial attorney with the U.S. Department of Justice Organized Crime and Racketeering Section, he conducted numerous long-term grand jury investigations and prosecutions against organized crime groups. Mr. Sopko began his professional career as a state prosecutor in Dayton, Ohio with the Montgomery County Prosecutor's Office. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Pennsylvania in 1974 and his law degree from Case Western Reserve School of Law in 1977. He is a member of the Bars of Ohio and the District of Columbia. Please join me in welcoming Mr. John Sopko. Thank you very much. Uh, Dean and Adrian for that uh, introduction. I don't really have to speak now. Um, I thought, you know, obviously since we're talking about international, I mean, it was very diplomatic uh, by Adrian. She saved to the very end 
that I graduated 45 years ago from this <laughs> illustrious institution. And it is a pleasure to be back. It has changed a lot in 45 years. Um, and it forced me, as I think a lot of uh, people when they come back to their alma maters, to sort of reflect uh, a little bit on what was it like in Cleveland in 1977. Uh, none of you were alive then, except maybe a professor or two. Uh, I was talking to my own senior leadership this morning, and <laughs> half of the, my senior leadership uh, hadn't been born by the time I graduated from this law school. But let me take it back a little bit before I start talking about what I really need to talk about, and that is Afghanistan and what has actually happened in Afghanistan. This is our latest quarterly report. It's online. I have a few copies. I don't know if any of you can see this. It's a whole bunch of women in burqas playing soccer because that's all they can do. If you're in Afghanistan and you're a woman now, you're born into a prison. And that's what happened after the longest war we have ever fought in our life. So we'll talk more about that. But in 1977, when I graduated and was sitting in your chairs, Cleveland was the bomb capital of the United States, as declared by the New York Times. The mayor was Mayor Ralph Perk. I don't know if you remember him. He's the guy who set his hair on fire. He was also the guy who said there was no organized crime in Cleveland. That's after we were declared the largest, the bomb capital of the United States. And uh, he was uh, uh, succeeded by Mayor Kucinich, the boy mayor, who I think was, uh, had the honor of driving the first major city in the United States into bankruptcy. So it was an interesting time. It was an interesting time because in that year, we had over 60 bombings in Cleveland. And I actually, when I was a freshman, uh, was a victim of it. I uh, was living up on Murray Hill when, uh, in the midst of a bomb war, there used to be Ulta House. I don't know if it's still there. Yes. It was a community yes. house. They used to park garbage trucks there. And one night, somebody came and blew up all the garbage trucks. And it's the only time in my life, you've always heard these things, I fell out of bed. It was the only time I actually fell out of bed, uh, or knocked out of bed, by the explosion. It was so huge. Ironically, I came back uh, to actually prosecute the people involved in that investigation. Uh, I was, at the time, what they called a, a Republic Steel scholarship. I worked four years in Republic Steel working down in the mills. So while I was in law school, I was working in the mills and doing two uh, pro bono, well one was actually being paid uh, uh, with a law firm, but the other one was working for the Organized Crime Strike Force for free. And it was because of that I eventually was hired by the Organized Crime Division of the Department of Justice, and later it was involved in the successful prosecution, it was the first successful prosecution, using RICO in 1982, even though the statute was passed in 1968, nobody in justice had ever figured out how to actually charge an organ the mafia uh, as an enterprise under the RICO statute. It was kind of interesting when we did that, Judge Thomas, who's passed away, was an excellent judge, threw the case out as being unconstitutional. I had to then argue the case before the Sixth Circuit and was reinstated. But it was an interesting time to be alive in Cleveland. And if that wasn't meant to bore you, but just so you know, tuition at that time at Case Western Reserve Law School was $3,000. And I was able to put myself through law school and also undergraduate, like I said, by working in the steel mills. So a lot has changed since 1977. 
you have a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you don't have the bombing capital of the world, you don't have a river that catches fire. I know that because a friend of mine created the, uh, actually a graduate of this law school, created the rowing center down in, uh, on the Cuyahoga River. But what I've been asked to talk about is not my life, I can do that all the time, or talk about Cleveland. We can talk about that all the time. But it's to talk about Afghanistan. <coughs> And what I'm giving you is what I call the three W speech. Who I am, what I do, why you should listen. Other than the fact you got free pizza. Now, I'm used to giving speeches where we give free pizza and free booze to get people to show up. But the key tells me that's a no-no uh, nowadays. Uh, when I was here, let's go back, we were smoking where you were. <laughs> I remember he, the dean just took me through the law school library, and I remember that was the place where uh, we would all go and smoke. So anyway, things have been changed for the best, I think. So let's start with that last W. Why should you be here? Why is what I'm talking about relevant to you here at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland? Many of you are going to be graduating, hopefully. Uh, and we'll be looking for work, but many are going to be living through the next crisis, and it may be going on right now. And I think we have to look at Afghanistan. It was and is still the longest war the United States has been involved in. And there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in that war. We lost 2,400 Americans soldiers. We lost about a thousand contractors. About a thousand allied troops were killed. And just so you know, this was the first time there was a NATO operation under Article 5, which meant coming to the mutual defense of another NATO ally. So we had multiple of allies involved in that war. Over 20,000 American soldiers, men and women, were injured. Over 70,000 Afghan soldiers died, and over 50,000 civilians, Afghan civilians, were killed. Probably twice as many, but that's the best count you can come up with. More importantly, we lost. Don't let anyone tell you differently. We lost. Everything we fought for we lost all the good things, hospitals, women's rights, free press, democracy building. We lost. Now you see my drift? My latest quarterly report basically lays out, and that's the latest quarterly report, you can get it online, that Afghanistan under the Taliban is far worse off than it was before. If you are born a woman now, if you're a woman, you're basically in prison. You can't work and you can't travel unless accompanied by a male member of the family. And it is the only country in the world that prohibits women and girls from going to high school, college, anything beyond so why is it important for you here at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, Ohio at this time? Because despite what the State Department says, despite what USAID says, despite what DOD has said, we are going to do it again. At some time in the future, and some can say we are doing it right now in the Ukraine, we will feel there is a national security issue in some country around the world where we are going to send in billions of dollars and we spent more money reconstructing Afghanistan than we did to do the entire Marshall Plan for Europe. <coughs> okay? So at some time in the future, we are going to decide, our policymakers, that it's time to send troops and to send money and try to rebuild a country in the midst of a war, rebuild their military and rebuild their governance. So, 
And the reason I say everybody else says we're not going to do it because we did it in Vietnam. And after Vietnam, we said, we're never going to do that again. <laughs> and we talked to all the generals and State Department officials, and they all said that was a big mistake. Because every capability we had in Vietnam dealing with that type of problem, we abolished, we eliminated, we got rid of. USAID was cut by 70%. State Department was cut. All of our counter insurgency capabilities in the military was cut. Because we're never going to do it again. Lo and behold, we did it in Iraq. Lo and behold, we did it in Afghanistan. And lo and behold, we are starting to do it in many countries in Africa, in the Horn, and some would say in Ukraine right now. And we're ignoring the lessons from Afghanistan. Our country doesn't learn lessons well. That's for sure. Um, and that is a problem. When I started my job uh, after Obama appointed me, uh, I remember having breakfast with General John Allen. Does anybody know who he is? He used to be our supreme commander in Afghanistan. He used to run the, God, well, I forget what, uh, what the it was, well, he, he ran CENTCOM. But he also, afterwards he retired, he uh, ran one of the think tanks in Washington. And John Allen told me, he says, you know, the uh, United States military does lessons learned. He said, uh, the Army will do lessons learned. The Navy will do lessons learned. And he even begrudgingly said the Air Force will. But is anybody doing purple lessons learned? What do we mean by purple? Purple is DOD-wide. Is anybody doing lessons learned in the State Department? Is anybody doing lessons learned in USAID? He said, John, and this was later confirmed, I was talking to uh, uh, an ambassador, and he said the same thing. He said, there is only one agency in the United States, with the exception of the National Security Council, which has what he calls whole of government jurisdiction. Let me sort of roll into who I am. I'm an inspector general. More importantly, I'm a special inspector general. <laughs> that sounds like a special agent of the FBI. I'm a special IG because this office goes out of existence. It ends when the amount of assistance, reconstruction assistance, falls below $250 million. We go out of existence eight months, nine months later. It's now about $8 billion we're spending still in Afghanistan, even though the Taliban run the place. Uh, what's different from the other 76 IGs is we're temporary. What's also different, because most IGs have law enforcement authority, we do too, has audit authority, we do too. But we are the only IG who's not housed in one particular government agency. So the DOD IG only can look at DOD programs. State IG can only look at state programs, aid, et cetera, et cetera. Go down the list of 76 IGs. I think even the you know, Library of Congress has an IG. Um, we and I don't know if it was a brilliant move on behalf of Congress, or was it by accident, like lot legislation in Washington, gave us jurisdiction to follow any US dollar spent on reconstruction in Afghanistan. So the concept about synergy, about the whole is bigger than the individual parts, it's very appropriate for a special IG because we can look how they all work together. And as Ambassador Crocker and General Allen and other people told me, the future for national security events and issues in the future is going to be whole of government. That means multiple US government agencies. So you need somebody to look the ability to look at the multiple US government agencies. 
More importantly, like Afghanistan and like Ukraine, and like some of the things we're doing in Africa, it's whole of governments. So in Afghanistan, we had 40-some countries helping. We had the UN helping. We had NATO helping. We had the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank. You name it, they were there. And boy, it was in a cluster because nobody was talking to each other. And so the, Al the Afghans, a, a corrupt Afghan, would play one country off against another. So if the US said, we're not going to build that hospital, a crooked Afghan oligarch would go to Germany or would go to some other NATO partner and get the hospital, get the road, get whatever. So it's important to have that ability to go beyond being stovepipe to an agency. So let me briefly just say what are some of the lessons we learned, because we are the only Inspector General out of all 76 that has a dedicated lessons learned office, where I have analysts, economists, trained investigators working together on issues that have been recommended to us, and I call it, uh, I have a place in Maine, so I usually hide out in Maine, particularly after COVID, what we call wickedly difficult issues <laughs> that will face the government. And this is a sheet I have some more I can hand out to you, which lists the 12 lessons learned reports that we have done. These are special reports. Nobody else in government, as I said, looks at the big picture, not the gotcha. Not the individual audit. We do that. We also send people to jail. We have about 150 people we've indicted and convicted. And all together through our investigations and audits, we recovered about eight, no, four billion dollars to the taxpayer. But those are important. Learn the lessons. Because otherwise, we're going to repeat the mistakes from the past. So let me quickly just rattle off to you seven of the major, or eight of the major key lessons from all of our reports. And ironically, <laughs> we issued this report two weeks before the Afghan government fell. People said, God, John, you were pressing. No, we weren't. We started at about, had, we had 700 some interviews for it. And its title is, catchy, What We Need to Learn. Lessons from 20 Years of Afghanistan Reconstruction. So reading from that, key issues, key lessons we learned. First of all, US government is not good at doing these things. And one of them is we don't know how to do real strategy. We didn't have a 20-year strategy. We had 21-year strategies in Afghanistan. That's not good. If you don't have a strategy, you don't know what you're supposed to accomplish. So how do you hold yourself accountable if you don't know where you're going? Second thing is, we totally underestimated repeatedly how long it takes to rebuild a country, to rebuild its country's military, do whatever. We imposed timelines that were good here in Washington, D.C., rather than what the timeline should be on the ground. And in many cases, we made vast mistakes because we ignored the uh, development experts at USAID on how long it would take. The other thing is corruption. We totally ignored corruption. And corruption is not a criminal justice issue in a place like Afghanistan or I would say in the Ukraine. It's not that they're exactly comparable. But corruption, as one Afghan senior official told me years ago, is corruption is not a, 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 a criminal problem. It's an endemic problem. Corruption is the government, and we ignored that to our peril. Because as a result, we got ourselves very close to a lot of oligarchs, warlords, and bad people who the Afghan citizens hated. And that's one reason why the Taliban survived. The Taliban actually looked good in comparison to the prosecutors, judges, and Afghan police that we sent to work with. Again, I remember a local official in Afghanistan telling me, when we talked about, well, we're going to be able to stabilize your province 
and send in police and prosecutors and judges. He said, no, that's the worst thing. We don't want the Kabul-based prosecutors, police, and judges because they are totally corrupt. The other fourth issue is many, if not all, of the institutions we created were not sustainable. And we ignored that. Because again, fast timeline. If you're a, a general, or if you're an ambassador, or if you're an aid official, and you're only there for a year, you've got to show success. So as a continuous happy talk, a continuous explanation to Congress and the American people that we are going to succeed. Happy talk. It turned out that we never really focused on the fact that the things we were creating would disappear once we left, which they did. Uh, as I mentioned, we had counterproductive personnel policies. Most of the people in Afghanistan that we sent were good people. They were there for six months, maybe a year if they were lucky. Well, what happens? We noted what we called in public testimony the annual lobotomy. 70 to 80 percent of our staff in Afghanistan left every year. So every year we had to send new people over to relearn all of the old issues which was counterproductive. Uh, we also ignored the fact that you can't rebuild a country if it's insecure. And that was, came out loud and clear. We also, as part of this, did not listen to the experts on Afghanistan and understand the Afghan context before we developed our programs and sent people there. And lastly, uh, we never had sufficient monitoring and evaluation of the programs. Again, the system is set up to produce good results for people who need to give good results to uh, Congress or to the various parliaments. So let me end with that. And if you want to talk about Ukraine, I'm happy to add to that, but I did promise the dean, I can talk for hours, I do that all the time. Uh, actually, I'm being asked to, two weeks from now, to go to the German Bundestag uh, to give presentation on lessons learned, and they're very interested, and this is the irony, is our European brethren who helped us are more interested <coughs> in our reports than our U.S. government. I don't know why. Uh, maybe because we lost and the Germans can always blame us. But anyway, they're very interested, so I'll be talking about that more. So anyway, let me end with that. Let me just end again. We have a 20-year-long Petri dish. You remember your biology? You drop a few things in and see if it grows and what doesn't grow. Why are we ignoring it? And that's why I turn that over to you, the next generation. My generation's over the hill. We're leaving you all these problems, you know? But uh, let's learn some lessons. Otherwise, as we all know from that adage, we will be doomed to fail again. Thank you very much, and I'm open to any questions. Because this is being uh, webcast, we need to have a sure. of these in our uh, Do we have one? Yeah, we're He's setting it up, yeah. Right. Oh, God, was that bleeped out, I hope? No, no, no. <laughs> you, you, they heard. Um, <laughs> let me start the first question off before the microphone gets around, and that is the most surprising thing that you said was that after we withdrew from Afghanistan, we're still giving $8 billion worth yeah. of aid yeah. to a government that we can't trust, that, that hasn't fulfilled any of its promises to us. What's up with that? Good question. Um, and that's a tough one. Most of the aid is humanitarian. So we feel we owe it to the Afghan people who are starving to death, who aren't getting medical care. Um, I would say education, but not much aid in that. So most of it is humanitarian. 
But uh, we also set aside $3.5 billion in a new fund, which is supposed to be sitting in, that is, in uh, uh, Switzerland, to recapitalize the central bank of Afghanistan without any of the money going to the Taliban. I don't know how they're going to do it. Uh, it's kind of tricky. And we sent a letter to state aid and treasury saying, how are you guys going to do this without the money actually getting to the Taliban, which is a no-no. You're not supposed to get money. So that's $3.5 billion. Uh, there's uh, blah, 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 $2 billion in uh, humanitarian. And the rest is in supporting uh, Afghans who fled. So a lot of those costs are that, that are costs. So we still got $2 billion. But the, the question that Dean is asking is really relevant. And this is a conundrum, and uh, I don't do policy, I just do process, but we know, common nature, the Taliban are getting a piece of the action. So, and the Taliban are also getting credibility, both internally and externally, because somebody is feeding them. Is that counterproductive? And we posed that question in our last quarterly report. I, 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 IGs do process. We don't do policy. And IG can't do policy, because if he does policy, how can he oversee it later? There's a conflict there. So we don't do uh, the policy. But we pose questions, and we're posing that question to Congress and the administration is, have you thought out what is the positive and negative? I remember I, I'm an econ, a fugitive from economics at uh, Wharton School. So it's uh, you know marginal cost and marginal return what is the marginal cost to us by maybe supporting the Taliban indirectly, not directly, versus any benefit by keeping some Taliban, some uh, Afghans uh, from starving? So anyway, it's a good question. I don't have an answer to that. But I hope our policymakers, who are a lot smarter than me, uh, remember, I was a C student here. So I mean, you know, uh, maybe they have the answer. So next question, ma'am. Adrian, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask, since you had talked a little bit about people comparing the situation to Ukraine, um, how much would you say that the, the fact that corruption in Afghanistan was um, endemic was influenced by their recent history in terms of the Soviet invasion, the American investment in the Mujahideen, and the fact that prior to 9-11, um, pr primarily their partners in the region were Iran, Russia, India, and um, Pakistan, compared to the fact that Ukraine, there seems to be a lot more investment from the West and from the EU uh, at the moment. Do you think that's a predictor of future success or not so much something that is a factor? Uh, good question. And, and the first thing I have to say is the Ukraine is not equal to Afghanistan. Totally different. And that was one of the mistakes we made in Afghanistan. We assume, I remember talking to people in USAID and contractors saying, oh, well, this program worked in Iraq, so we're applying it to Afghanistan. No, 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 Iraq was different than Afghanistan. Big difference, Ukraine and Afghanistan. Ukraine, Western country, a lot of Western values, pretty free and independent press. They're technologically skilled. Uh, they've had access to the West. Um, prior to the Russians blowing everything up, they had a pretty well-working uh, infrastructure. Um, they also have been facing the problems of corruption for a while. The similarity, and this is where you really get a problem, and if any of you are studying development, there's something called the absorption rate. We are spending more money in the Ukraine right now than we did in the first 15, 10, 15 years we did in all of Afghanistan. We're doing that in one year. And our analysis, as we talk about, is that within a year and a half, if we still spend at this rate, you are going to equal or surpass the amount of money in a year and a half that we spent in Afghanistan. Now, I talked about absorption rate. Any of you have studied development? Absorption rate is how much money a country <coughs> can absorb before it's basically wasted. Think of it this way. Your kitchen, you put a sponge. You pour
for a while. The sponge holds it. The sponge holds it. The sponge holds it. Then all of a sudden, boom. The water goes all over the floor, and then you got to clean it up. Usually, they talk about a 15 to 25% GDP to absorb before money historically gets wasted. By waste, it's waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, I don't know what the GDP is in the Ukraine. And I don't know if anybody's figured that out. Maybe the World Bank has. I don't know if we've surpassed the absorption rate. In Afghanistan, we, the United States, we <coughs> testified about this, we exceeded 100% of the GDP in over half the years we were there. So are you surprised about corruption? Number two, go to the corruption problem in Afghanistan. I, I, I praise Zelensky and his staff for uh, firing a whole bunch of people. I think you've all read about it in the last two weeks. Um, but Ukraine has always had a corruption problem. People forget, 10 years ago, and fired all their police because they were corrupt or working for the Soviet or the Russian, not the Soviet Union. How quickly we forget that. Uh, so I think we have to face that. We're sending a lot of money. And when you send a lot of money, there's going to be waste. And what it is, it's going to go to oligarchs, it's going to go to corrupt people. And I think back on this. It's a noble cause with the Ukrainian people are doing. I agree. No, there's a guy from history who also looked at corruption at another noble time. And his name was Harry Truman. He worked for the U.S. Senate. And he did a series of hearings before what later became the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, where I worked. That's how I know this, because I read all the reports. Harry Truman was looking at war profiteering at the beginning of World War II. And most people say World War II was maybe one of our last noble exercises in military power, give or take. You can debate it. But even then, even when it's noble, there's going to be fraud, there's going to be nepotism, there's going to be waste, there's going to be abuse. So you've got to keep that in mind. I don't know if that answers it. A little bit. A little bit. We can go off layering, and I can tell you more about it. But anyway, they do have in place a rather robust press. They do have in place a rather robust set of laws, which Afghanistan didn't have, but later created, but then ignored. So that's the problem. Okay. So. Thanks, ma'am. Thanks so much for speaking with us this afternoon. Uh, my question is about building trust with the Afghan people. Uh, I, my family is Afghan. I go back and forth, uh, kind of growing up all my life, and um, I've spoken to a lot of people on the ground, and I know that you know, <coughs> th there is a lot of mistrust, unfortunately, around you know American military operations and just the American presence in Afghanistan in general. Um, what, I mean, you alluded to kind of a perhaps like a second Afghan invasion. How you know? as horrible as the Taliban are, I don't, I, I'd like to kind of get a sense for what you think about, you know, what people, what the Afghan people will respond, um, just having, you know, I, I don't have to go down the laundry list, but, uh, you know, we're, you're here to talk about corruption. Ashraf Ghani literally left the country in, like, a van with his billions, and, you know, it was just it was such a scandal of epic proportion, and, the scale of corruption in Afghanistan is enormous, so you know, rightly, Afghans are quite skeptical of the American presence. Um, for what it's worth, I think what we had in Afghanistan with the Americans uh, was definitely be <laughs> infinitely better than what it looks like now and what it looked like during this, you know, the time the Taliban were in power in the 90s. But um, I just I was curious about your thoughts. Um. Where to start? F first of all, uh, there was a recent Gallup poll, and I don't know how they did it, among the Afghans. Um, 
which we quoted in our latest quarterly report, for whatever it's worth, and again, very difficult to do Gallup polls in Afghanistan um, <coughs> or anywhere. And uh, I think the vast majority of Afghans say it's worse now than it was under the Ghani regime or, you know, the American-supported uh, regime. Uh, there are serious problems with uh, uh, how women are being treated. The economy is a mess. I think the Taliban have learned that it was easier to win than it was to govern. But on the other hand, I have to admit that it's a lot safer for the average Afghan. They're not concerned about uh, night raids. They're not concerned, con concerned about drone attacks. Uh, I've talked to a number of Afghans uh, and also journalists who are going over to Afghanistan, and they say they can travel the country. Uh, they don't have to worry about being stopped by Taliban and being shook down, or they're not worried about kidnapping. So on the one hand, it's safe if you're a male, uh, and you can find some jobs and whatever. I, I, I don't, I, it's hard for me to speak for an African. Uh, I can just speak that the programs that we spent all the money setting up have failed. They're, they're ignored. So the rule of law has gone out the window. Uh, the, the programs we set up on health, on education. Well, education is okay if you're a male. Uh, uh, the free press, that was one of the successes we had in Afghanistan. I think it was a relatively free press. That's gone. So I don't know how to answer that question as an Afghan. Uh, I can just look at the programs and look at what we spent the money for. Let me just go back. One thing you have to learn about ideas, <coughs> and you should do this too, when you study a program, you look at inputs, outputs, and outcomes. Inputs, you should know. I mean, that's money going in. How much money did we spend on this program? What did we buy or get for that program, for that money? So if you were spending money on shoes, you got 10 million shoes. If you were building roads, you got 10,000 hectares, or not hectares, but uh, miles of uh, roads. What was the outcome you were trying to accomplish? That's what IGs look at, or should be. And I look at the outcomes. Over 20 years, we said, this is what our outcomes, this is what we want to accomplish. Now, maybe it was totally unrealistic, but we wanted to create a little America. You tell me as an Afghan American, whoever that's, was even possible. But that, and again, I don't question policy. IGs can never question policy. That was the policy, and that's what I hold our government programs up against, and they fail. From a counterterrorism point of view, there's a big question. And this is where have the Taliban lived up to their agreements under the Doha Agreement, and the State Department says, and we quote them in the quarterly report, they have not. So there is going to be some major problems with terrorism against, uh, I, I think, uh, ISIS is back, and I don't know if you've noticed in the press, a number of foreign embassies, I think the Saudi, the Qatar, the uh, the uh, had to close down their embassies in Kabul because of the security situation. And I think the UN is <laughs> sort of shutting down a lot of movements because of the security situation. So there still is a terrorism issue we have to deal with. I don't know if that answers your question. I apologize if it doesn't. We can talk offline if you want. So, okay. Anything else? Hi. I'm, uh, I'm wondering about uh, if your jurisdiction extends to U.S. military operations, specifically payments to U.S. weapons manufacturers and other private companies. Um, and if not, do those military operations get the same level of scrutiny as reconstruction? Uh, we had jurisdiction over what's called reconstruction. And basically, reconstruction is defined, poorly it was defined in the statute, covered basically everything except 
the actual U.S. war fight. So all of the money that went to the Pentagon to buy weapons, food, fuel, you name it for the Afghans, the training, the helicopters, the airplanes, and all that, we could look at that. We did not look at U.S. fighting capabilities and how they did it and you know whether they bought the right things and whether it's fraud or waste. That would have been DODIG. So that was just by statute. We only looked at reconstruction. And do you think that that's the same level of scrutiny? I mean, like you described your position as having you this. You want me to be honest? No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get invited to a DOD IG party, uh, but I don't care. Um, you know, I'm like, it's like Harry Truman said, you know, if you want, a, if you want a friend and you're an IG in Washington, go buy a dog. Um, that's not our job. Our job, IG should be speaking truth to power. IG should not worry about being invited to parties, and IG should not worry about their next job. You know, working for, you know, I'm tired of seeing all the generals and admirals working for Lockheed and all the other defense contractors. To me, that sounds a little distasteful. So, like, if George Washington went and worked for a cannon manufacturer back in the 70s, whatever happened about that, or George Marshall did. Uh, but anyway, well, I, I, I digress. Uh, no, I don't think they are, because the DODIG, and it's not the DODIG's fault, DODIG has to look at the entire world. Okay? We were like laser focused. We only looked at Afghanistan, only looked at reconstruction, so we could be laser focused. You know, that's the debate now whether they should create a special IG in the Ukraine. I personally think they should, because that's, we did a pretty, uh, my, my comrade, Sigur, special IG for Iraq, did a pretty good job. I think we've done a pretty good job of, of tooting my own horn. Special IGs were created for emergency situations where a lot of money is being spent, particularly in a war zone. We've developed an expertise for that. And that's what IGs can do. Again, we can look at the cracks, the seams between all of the various government agencies and governments. The DOD IG can't. I'll give you one quick example. I don't know if we have enough time. You tell me if I'm running over. We have 10 minutes. 10 minutes. OK, real quick. Some of the worst cases, I was just interviewed by, I forget who it was, NBC or something about, yeah, yeah, give me a list of some of your worst boondoggles you found. Okay, and I, yeah, they gave them a list. I mean, it's like every time we turned over a rock, something ugly crawled out in Afghanistan. Two cases, two examples I gave them, and this shows the difference between our thinking and the DODIG. One is the G222. I don't know if you ever heard about it. It was a, a, uh, 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 a military airplane, it was a, a, to carry freight. In cargo, cargo plane. We bought the G222 uh, from an Italian contractor out of a boneyard in Sicily. Bad thing to start with, boneyard, Sicily, Italy. OK, uh, I can make that pun half the time. Uh, and I did the mafia. So I understand Sicily. So I see these planes sitting at the Cabo International Airport, these big, hulking, gray things with trees growing between them. And I used to go over to Afghanistan four or five times a year. So every general, every admiral, every aid official, every ambassador saw these hulking things for years. Finally, I said, what are they? That's an important thing of oversight. They need somebody on the ground to kick the tires. I learned that as a young prosecutor in Dayton, Ohio. An old guy took me aside and said, kick the tires, go to the scene of the crime. It's amazing what you'll learn. It's not in the police files. So anyway, I finally say, what are those? And everybody says, hush, hush, can't tell you. So I'm very nice. I understand how things work. I said, OK, next time I come, I'm walking across the airport, the tarmac. And if you want to arrest me or stop me from going there, great. I'm not going to fight. I don't carry a gun, you know? But it'll be front page New York Times, Washington Post. Lo and behold, next time I come to town, there's this. Really sharp. Colonel, U.S. Air Force, comes up. And this is when you're an investigator, you know you really want. Shakes my hand and says, General, we're never going to do that again. <laughs> Bingo, even a poor guy who was a Sikh student here at Case Western said, hmm, that's telling me something. <laughs> so they bought the planes, they couldn't fly. So we actually interviewed pilots who landed them and parts fell off. <laughs> okay? So, 
We look closer. We find out the DOD IG came in and actually did a really good audit. It looked at spare parts. Never asked the big question. Why the hell did you buy them? And who got paid? Unfortunately, we can't indict people. We got to turn them over to justice, and we can't get generals fired. We have to turn it over to the DOD, and nothing happened. Second case, the 64K. 64,000 square foot headquarters built at Camp Leatherneck. Any Marines here? Ex Marines? I understand. Camp Leatherneck, that's what they were for the surge. $36 million to build it. <coughs> I had a general be in a defect in a dining hall and say, John, you've got to look at this. This is the problem. Milcon, military construction. Once you get it, you spend it, even if you don't need it. So we discovered that this building was built over the objection of the Marine Corps general who said, I don't want it, don't build it, I won't use it. But we built it. And it was the best looking headquarters I'd ever seen. Once again, the DOD IG came in and was looking at either doors or safety equipment or overhead sprinklers and did a good report, but never asked the question, what, the big question. And that's what special IGs can do because we look at whole of government. We can raise the big question. There's the difference between special IGs and regular IGs. They come in and they check the box. To answer the big question. Again, it was another case we identified, we recommended that somebody get fired. Waste of money. You know what the answer was from DOD? It was a supplemental appropriation, and we could not return the money to Congress without causing a political problem. Great. Let me end with one thing. I didn't, 10 minutes. I don't, I don't want you people to think that every ambassador, every general, every aid official, every contractor we sent over there was corrupt or stupid or venal or whatever. 98% of those people were doing the best thing they could with the job they had. But we gave them all a box of broken tools. Then we said, shame on you, you wasted the money. Shame on you, you lost the war. Shame on you. No. We gave them a contracting system that's broken. If you go and look at GAO, DOD contracting's been on the high risk list since GAO created the high risk list 30 years ago. We gave them a personnel system where staff came in not trained, just hired, we needed a body, and they stayed six months, maybe a year, and left. And they had to show success. We gave them an appropriation system which demanded success, even though everybody knew it wouldn't happen. I remember talking to a woman, a poor woman, who used to raise goats in Italy. I don't know if you ever heard about this. Where we sent millions of dollars to take sexy Italian white goats and ship them on DOD airplanes to Afghanistan to breed with probably the less sexy and dumber Afghan goats. Nothing personal against Afghan goats. <laughs> Everyone I've met, I've liked. <laughs> well, it turned out this poor woman told her, she said, I told them it would take two or three years. They had to show success for the next appropriation cycle. So keep that in mind. That's why it's so important to study oversight. It's so important. Don't forget, when you think of jobs, oversight. We're going out of existence, so I can't hire any man. But, you know, that's important. You need somebody in the government who speaks truth to power who's not afraid of getting fired. When I took this job, I assumed I was going to be fired after the first year. Didn't happen. Uh, I think it's because they needed somebody. 
they needed top cover for all the money we were wasting. So as long as we had Sokka screaming and yelling, yeah, we could still appropriate more money. I don't know. But that's, how, that's politics in Washington. I apologize. Am I out of time? No, it's fine. We have, uh, if there's a burning, burning question, we have just one let, minute. Let me ask the last one. Yeah. Question. There you go. So, John, one of the fastest growing areas of this law school is our compliance program. A yeah. lot of interest in that. And it seems like that's very much directly related to yep. Inspector General work. Yep. What is your advice to our students who are thinking about going out and want to be the next John Sopko? <laughs> <laughs> Go get a big job in a law firm, make a lot of money, send your kid to Harvard, and then you can come back and help. No, I mean, I think it's a noble cause. Uh, that's what I did at Aiken Gump. Uh, work for them, the, for the Gump. It's Aiken Gump, famous international law firm. It's which not Squires. Not, it's not Squires, Anders, and Dempsey. Uh, no, it's what? Squires. Uh, oh, that's right. They merged Bob. since I left. Everything changes. So... Uh, you know, I think this is a noble cause. You know, I've spent most of my life working in the government and almost 90% of my time doing oversight. You need oversight. You need good oversight. You need bipartisan oversight. You need not partisan. I, I worked for one of the founders of modern congressional oversight, John Dingell, and it was an eye-opener to him. I worked for Sam Nunn from Georgia. It was an eye-opener. These were states, and these were people who knew that good oversight should be bipartisan or nonpartisan, and good oversight should speak truth to power. And they actually said, both of them, that good oversight is also good politics. I think political oversight is not good politics, because the American people see through it. So to somebody going into compliance, compliance can mean a lot of things. A lot of the people I know who go into compliance get very frustrated because like some DOD auditors or some of the people who were hired by USAID who wrote some very good reports, monitoring and evaluation. As a matter of fact, we, did, we had a lessons learned report on monitoring and evaluation. And the title of that report, I think you'll like, is doing the wrong thing perfectly. Okay, read that report. For of you guys going into compliance. The problem is, again, companies usually don't like to hear bad news. Appropriators don't like to hear bad news. A lot of monitoring and evaluation. Yield, guts of the report, get cut and end up on the floor. That's what a lot of people told us out of Afghanistan. So you have to be careful. You've got to make certain you're appreciated if you're doing a good job in monitoring and evaluation. How about a big round of applause for you? Thank, Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Yeah, that one's not